So, Enrico gave me hype converged infrastructure as a topic. I like to talk about that for a couple of minutes. Um, first of all, um, I usually don't put a slide in there who I am, but people ask me to do it. Um, I started over 10 years ago as sysadmin, sysengineer um, in the environments of the customers themselves, moved on to uh, working for a reseller as consultant, uh, pre-sales, and then in the end became team lead. Um, and at that point in time, I already was uh, blogging, went to some tech field days, HP discovers and so on, on invitation. Um, and then people said, um, you've got a really big mouth, but why don't you do something with that? So I became um, EMEA evangelist for Veeam, um, of which uh, Luca, who is in the room now, took my role over later on. Um, and today I do all those things that I have been doing in the last 10, 15 years independently uh, on a contract base. So I do both technical and influencer marketing for vendors, and I also still do hands-on consultancy for resellers and customers. Could be an audit of storage or data protection, could be an implementation, uh, or could be helping with a, with a new offer if they want to have a new storage platform. Lastly, what I want to add as well is you've heard the first host of our podcast this morning, Nigel, the container guy. I'm the second host. There's three more hosts. Um, definitely worth listening. Uh, however, um, in contrast with this Kool-Aid dream guy that is busy with things that maybe will happen in five to ten years, I still like to work with existing technologies that's why I do field stuff. That's why I like working with actual customers where you see um, things that gradually grow, where existing technologies get new purpose, right? And that still works. Um, uh, I just wanted to put in the slide with the picture of my nice watch that I got from Storage Field Day, guys, um, which is existing technology that has evolved. Let's move on. For this presentation, I have expectations for you and a disclaimer. The expectations are that I will define for you the hype of hyperconvergence, I'll talk with a little bit about a couple of things that you would see um, in those products, the differentiations, um, and in the end, a little bit on what do I think about, what, what is the next step with this. Um, the disclaimer is that I did not take my meds this morning, so there could be strong language. Um, it keep me down so the Hulk doesn't come out, right? Uh, let's move on to what we want to talk about. I promised you to define um, hyperconvergence, and there is no definition. Hyperconverged is not an industry standard. We had a couple of blog posts about that in the last, uh, I think, Ad wrote one. Um, a couple of days ago, like we're all talking about this hyperconverged thing, but they're not all the same. Some of them have more components or less components. What is an industry standard? What what do we? Why do we have these different things that are underneath one name? What is the industry standard for a car? What are the components you need for a car? Like four wheels and an engine. I think that pretty much is the minimal components you need to have a car. However, if you add components, like two more wheels, would you consider that still a car? I think we do. If you remove components, would you still consider that a car when it has only three wheels? <laughs> so my point is into hyperconvergence. You'll have a lot of vendors that say, these are the minimum, minimal components you need to have to become a hyperconverged solution. And others will say, well, that component is not really necessary to be a hyperconverged solution. Um, I have three HP microserver uh, fresh boxes here. And I want to give them away, because I have three questions. First one that answers gets, uh, gets the box. What's the model of our six-wheel car? 
G. No one. G63. Okay, who was the first with the G that was that side? It's the G63. What's the name of that second car? <laughs> You're just waiting for it. Final question. Which British comedian made this pretty well known in the last two decades? Hmm? Actually was looking for Mr. Bean. Who was that? That were in, in a lot of episodes of Mr. Bean, you will see their line going, tipping over in a parking lot, just to make it a little bit funny, this presentation. OK, let's move on. Um, what are the components for me? So everything I tell you today is merely my opinion. And any other analyst or vendor can have a different opinion just because of the fact that it is not a standard, which is, probably, which is by the way, the same for cloud and software defined and all those other buzzwords. For me, the minimum you have to have, well, for a lot of people, this, this is kind of the basics. You need to have a hypervisor, and your storage needs to live in that hypervisor, distributed, and you're, you will expand that in nodes. In the hypervisor. On the hypervisor, in the hypervisor. Oh. No. You are right. We are going to touch on that in and on the hypervisor. However, so local storage and you scale per nodes. That is the two basic components that most of the vendors will tell you when you have this, it's enough. You've got a hyperconverged solution, right? Node-based, I'll give you an, and give you an appliance, and it has a hypervisor and storage. I kind of disagree. Um, once you have storage, you could add more components. And we'll see that in a transition in the next coming years. A couple of vendors have already added. Remember the six wheels we had with the Mercedes, right? We're going to add components. They're not necessarily defining the standard, but it could be that they add more components, and there could be more vendors following up on that. Now, for me, storage includes deduplication and all the features, right? I, I, I will not call it a different component. But I do see networking. We actually have at least one vendor. I think it's Arista that is doing hyperconverged just for the hypervisor and networking. Uh, so we already have that differentiation of different types of hyperconverged solutions. Backup could be included, um, security, data analytics, all done not on a storage box with an application on top, but within the hypervisor itself. Could be in a, in a microservice, could be a VSA running on top of that. It will probably start with VSAs. We, we see that now. Uh, already with security um, as, as distributed VSAs, or NSX is, is another example. Um, for me, the key component that is missing in this whole slide is this one. For me, a hyperconverged solution has nothing to do with the technologies as such, but in the way you manage your infrastructure. Everything is managed from a cluster. Everything is, you create a cluster, you add a node, you uh, retire a node, and all those components are integrated in that same wizard. Is there, I think there's probably not a single vendor, not even the early uh, hyper-converged vendors that have all those components in the single install wizard. I'm just talking about the logics of what for me hyperconvergence as a node-based architecture going forward means. Um, to prove you that people will throw new definitions on, on it just to sell their own product, I've got this um, little thing that the little bird tweeted a couple of weeks ago. Someone, and I, I'm not, uh, I don't want to use his name or company, tweeted this, the, method, the mathematical term hyper means more than four. So if you only converge server and storage, how can you be hyper-converged? This is so wrong in so many ways. First of all, four, hyper does not mean four in mathematics. It is only in geometry when you have more than four dimensions. That's where you go to. So that's the first issue he makes. The other issue, problem he makes is why would the word hyper, meaning four in geometry, have 
anything to do with how we define an infrastructure. So you're, you're going to see a lot of marketing people trying to throw in um, their own definition of hyperconverged, and that one does not make sense at all. Where hyperconvergence makes most sense is into how you manage your infrastructure, how do you manage everything um, that is resource-based. If there's people here that run their own infrastructure or consultants that work in the field, not you, Nigel, I know, um, but people that do actual work in the field, they'll buy new storage, and the first year, they're so happy. And they're so in love with their storage. It's all this brand new thing. In the second year, they're still quite happy because that thing does exactly what they wanted. However, in the third year, you bought that storage. And I'm, I'm generalizing here, right? It could be already in the second year. It could be to the fourth year that it moves. Um, but you kind of have this, I bought this thing, but I, now I see that new feature there or there, and I can't use it because my vendor will not allow me to do that in my storage array. Um, but I still got three more years to go before I get my next new array. So the year after that, I'm getting really angry already on my infrastructure because this feature that I wanted, it's still not coming. And I start doing my research because we're in the fourth year and in the fifth year, I'll be out of support and I really will need to have a new array by then. In the last year, you're doing that buying cycle, the RFP and the buying. You're looking at all this new technology and you are so angry at a, on a daily basis about what you're actually doing on. I see a couple of laughs. Is there people that feel like this in the, in, in the, in the daily work? I think this resonates to people that actually work in the field. And this is only storage. We have the same buying cycle for our network switched a year later because we just implemented something new. The next thing is going to be a year later. We have the same for computer, maybe a couple of other um, infrastructure components that we have this five-year buying cycle where we're merely happy for two years with that machine. Whether or not it cannot cope with what we want from a performance perspective or features that we cannot use. Those are the two main issues we have. The result of this, if you count all this up, is that you have an IT infrastructure team that is never happy. This is the general feeling of the regular infrastructure management team. Anyone that works in the field really understands what I mean here. Now this changes if, you, if all of those components that I spoke to you about on the first slide that should be in hyperconverged. If all those components are within that same box, I'll have the happy faces here. And I will just buy more boxes that have the performance of that year. They, they will have a new CPU. They probably are a solution that can bring in more components, so I will not be unhappy because I'm missing a couple of features. They probably will be able to bring in those features. I actually, this is not, I see a couple of laughs and you say it's real, right? I also talked actually to customers that have bought hyperconverged solutions. This is one of them. Brian Beck, CTO of Geo Foundation, um, multiple sites in all over the US, and he put some hyperconverged solutions left and right. And what he literally said here my selling point to CFO and CEO is, I just need more resources. And, the, and they say, well, it's working, so just buy more. And he does this constantly. He just started off with a couple of storage nodes, looked at what he needed, and like, well, I need more CPU, let's buy a CPU heavy box, the next one. Or let's buy a storage heavy box, the next one. He puts a cluster like that in a remote office, the only person that works there on technology is the janitor. The only thing the guy needs to do is power on, power off, if it's ever necessary. There's no IT people for him in the, in the, small, uh, the small environments outside um, of his, uh, his main data center. So, and this is not just him. 
Every single customer that has bought hyperconverged solutions has that exact feeling. I just buy something and I'll see what I need and I'll add what I need in the future. This guy's been doing it for three to four years, so it's not just the first year that he said, oh, ho, 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 because that's what probably a couple of people said, well, that's when it's new, right? No, that's not what, it, what it's you. This is constant, and he just asked for more money for more resources. That's the only thing he needs to ask. Next up, how do you split your daytime as an IT team? Most of it, it's like 40% of your time will be firefighting, keeping the lights on, problem resolving. 40% of your time will be planned maintenance. This could be skewed left or right, okay? So don't, don't find me over the percentages here. And then there's about 10, 20% left to do new projects. What is the main issue with this time management? The money of the business is there. And we're not doing that. We as IT people are responsible for giving the business the, the new things they need to have a competitive edge to, to the competitors. So we don't have enough time. We're, we're just working on our daily management and firefighting all the time. What happens if you lose a full time? We had three people, or the equivalent of three people. What if we're cut down for 30%? We're going to cut down on the planned maintenance because we don't have this time. By cutting down on the planned maintenance, we're going to have more firefighting. And there is no time whatsoever for new products, projects. And what happens there is when it really, really gets nasty, they're going to hire some very expensive consultants because we don't have enough resources internally. Now, with the hyperconverged solutions, we are shrinking down both the firefighting and the plant maintenance. Um, I think uh, Nutanix in their next release will have um, ESXi and BIOS upgrades at the same time that you're doing the, I want to upgrade my Nutanix cluster. So while you're upgrading your storage, let's upgrade the hypervisor. Let's see if we have new BIOS drivers and all. Like the whole stack. Combine this with all the other components in the beginning I talked to you about that we could put in that box. Networking, security. That's the plant maintenance. Let's drive that down into a single wizard and a single action. Rolling upgrades. Right? No manual labor. That's going to shrink down. And there's going to be less firefighting. And in the end, there's going to be a lot more time for you to support the business with new projects. And this is how you... This is the true value of hyperconverged infrastructures. The fact that this maintenance and firefighting is shrink down to far less. You would say that I'm saying this in favor of the vendors, that I'm supporting them. I actually spoke to, spoke to customers. That's why, I, why I'm telling you this. Every single customer I talk to has said this, with hyperconvergence, um, this one is an example. John Venter, poster display. I was hired to be the manager of IT, and I did that about 60% of the time. Now, after he acquired the hyperconverged solutions, he's down to about 20% of infrastructure management, and everything else is business development. This is exactly what I told you. This is the benefit of moving to these hyperconverged solutions. Has nothing to do with technology as such. Has nothing to do with performance as such. Has nothing to do with features. It's about the business value. This is where hyperconvergence fits. Implementation projects. I've been a consultant, went into a customer, and they needed, um, uh, think of the physical to virtualization migrations, right? You had to have three uh, ESXi host, couple of switches, storage box. And this was pretty much for a small infrastructure, the implementation time. First day, rack and stack and cabling and blah, blah, blah. Second day, let's make sure all the components are ready. And then the third day, let's add up the vCenter cluster management, template building. At least three, I think, uh, could be left, or could be four days, could be five days, could be two days. But you were at least three to four days busy with building a minimal infrastructure basics before you even start 
deploying your first VM, unless it's a template, of course. I kind of care. <coughs> and after the fourth or the fifth day or the second week, you can start working for the business applications, migrating that SharePoint environment, upgrading that Exchange environment, or whatever else application you want to do. This is where the business earns their money. This is what your customer, if you are a consultant, these this are the hours a customer really wants to pay for. These two guys, uh, Steven and Lode, at the last VMUG in Belgium, instead of doing a regular demo, they did a competition to Nutanix engineers. Within the presentation, while, uh, while the presenter was on, they configured ESXi, set up the whole cluster, provisioning vCenter, uh, creating the, uh, the HADRS, and then doing some, uh, some failovers. Within that 40 minute time, two clusters making them work together, the only trickery they did, and I have to add this, the only trickery they did is they had the vCenter ready to deploy, right? So once they had the, the Nutanix cluster build, they pushed a vCenter they had. So that's the only trickery they did. However, they did all of this coming in with a box that is clean to deploying VMs and a replication infrastructure within 40 minutes. So this is how Evo Rail does it. Same type of thing. Wizard-based install of the whole cluster everything, all the components. Now today, it's going to be the hypervisor and storage, but tomorrow, the other components will come in. What do I want to show you um, with this slide is when I built the cluster, I choose a name for the host, but what do you want to do when the next node comes in? That's right, in half a year time, I need to have a new node. Well, I've already added an iterator, or you're going to iterate by numbers or by letters, and it's just, the next node is gonna add just like 0, 2, 0, 3. I don't even want to put that in there again. I don't even want to put new IP addresses in again because I'll give it an IP pool. Whenever I add a new node, so this is bringing that implementation period down, shrinking it down. And in the end, instead of this, you'll get this. You'll get a lot more time to work for the business application rather than for infrastructure management as such. Um, let's move on to what now in the market. Up till last year, we had these players, Nutanix and Plivity Scale Computing were the first. I'm, I'm saving time on deploying the, cloud, the, the infrastructure mm -hmm. using this kind of technologies, but if the final goal is still to run my business application on top of it, and the deployment of the application still takes weeks or months, I don't care about, so. No, I mean, I'm saving you're, a couple of days compared to a non-converged infrastructure, which is good, but still compared to the overall time, uh, saving is minimum. I mean, I'm just I, saying I you should not no, be I mean, spending time at all on I understand the marketing reason to push a lot on this, ready to go in half an hour. But from a business perspective, once I've saved this one single day. If you go to smaller customers that just hire you to do the implementation of a private cloud. Which a private is, cloud in a small customer? Hmm? A private cloud in a small well, customer? Well, let's say the, the, the <laughs> classic three hosts, switches and, and, okay. and an ecologic box or whatever. These three days, if someone else comes in and says, I can do it in half a day. As a consultant, I would say right? that I'm losing money. Hmm? As a consultant, I would say that I'm losing money. Well, because it's less days for consultancy. No, no, I, get, I get your point. I totally get your point. You but why, why would you? Why would you tell your customer that he needs six days to just build an infrastructure if it can happen in half a day? This is insulting your customer. This is dragging their money unnecessary. If I can tell that customer I can do it in half a day, so we'll get more time to do different things. Customer will have more time and money. I have a so, question. Actually, not a question, but uh, in my experience, provisioning new hardware in a large company is a mess. So there is a process which is very, very long, and mm -hmm. you have an, an hyper-converged infrastructure where you can add a node, yeah. just uh, any other sources. It, it, it's also easier to buy. Yes. Because so that's you have a fixed price, it's a fixed node, and you, yeah. 
So, yeah, one or multiple SKUs. You buy, you just add resources, and all the components are integrated in that, and you are not losing time with the integration yeah. as such. So I it's a logical discussion here, not in in uh, in real hours in, in time. And every customer that I have ever met would have loved me to tell them this. I can do this in one sixth of the time and give you more time to work on actual business applications. Let's move on to the market. Yes. Infrastructure deployment. Yes. Now my question is, to what? Hmm? Uh, you're going to switch to what kind of consultancy? Well, I, I was working yeah. in my team. We did, all, we did all the application migrations as well. So why not help the customer more with the business side of the applications? All right. So this is switch also in your mentality? Yes. Um, I will come. There's a switch in the mentality. There will be more time to do best of breed solutions and that's actually coming at the at the summary of my presentation so let's go back to the market today we've got these players IDC put up this um, I don't know how they call it um, graph where they have the leaders on the top uh, there's one in here EMC who did not even have a product at that time in the market so I don't even have an idea I need to move on very fast now um, who didn't even have a product at the time so I have no idea why they were here but these were the vendors up until last summer, right? In the last 12 to 18 months, this is what happened. Every other week today, Nigel and I, we cover uh, on the podcast the news of the data centers. How many new hyperconverged solutions have we announced in the podcast in the last six months? Half of these have come out in the last six months. None of them have all those components that I told you about. Most of them do not do hyperconvergence as I see it today. And we'll probably never get there. So let's move on. Uh, um, I'll move on this quick. Is this me? Okay. Um, yeah, uh, a couple, a couple uh, logical things. I actually want to move fast on this one. Um, everyone has seen this, the kernel-based versus the VSA-based, right? This is probably faster. Then this is because you have to convert the hyper, go through the hypervisor a couple of times. This is only for a local read. As soon as you do anything over the network to the second node, you're losing all that advantage. Right? So this is a non-issue. Second one, uh, deduplication is free. Um, I'll move this. Anyone understands what the difference is between compression and deduplication? Right? Whatever you do, however you do it, it is going to cost you money because you need resources. This is not for free. But there's a lot of places where you can do it. You can do it in line in the hypervisor or in the, or in the VSA. You can do it at rest on the local storage. You can do it in line on a controller, or you can do it at rest on your storage array. Those are the four key areas. Wherever you want to do it, it's going to cost you resources. It's going to cost you CPU cycles. And you know what? Our Intel CPUs are not always that good at that. That's why some companies will still have, and this is SimpliVity, some companies will come up with a proprietary solution. And it's not a bad thing. Wherever you want to do it, there, there's always a benefit and there's a cost. Every solution in technology is designed with trade-offs, and that's a good thing. You just look for the vendors that tell you we're doing it this way, that's why this is what we are paying to do that. If someone tells you that uh, vendor is not doing it well because they're not doing it like we do, think about this picture. You can do it anywhere. There's always trade-offs in how you build technology, and that's a good thing. This is one to look out for. We've seen all hyper-converged hyper solutions starting off on ESXi, adding on Hyper-V, and they're not like, we're ready to move to KVM because it's free and it's cheap. However, the hyper-converged management cluster is using APIs not to talk to the hypervisor. They're all talking to the cluster manager to do the management of the hypervisor. 
Now, who can tell me what the cluster manager is for KVM? There is none. They'll have to build it. So if you have a hyper-converged vendor coming to you and saying we could do it all for free in the KV on KVM, ask them how their high availability and DRS and all that stuff is managed. Because that is the power of vCenter. There's, there's a couple of them um, that are doing this, but they have to build it for scratch. Or, even or they ha they'll have to buy it anyway from Red Hat. So free does not exist here as well. Keep in mind, there's a lot of, there's, there's a reason why they're using the, the managers to do that, the cluster managers. There's a reason, because these are very powerful things. There's a re these have been 10 years in, into design in R&D. You can't do that in one year. So what's next? I don't know, you don't know, probably no one knows. Where I, where I want to go with this shortly, briefly, sorry, is three years ago, I told my boss at that time that I saw data domain. I saw HP starting with their uh, store ones, and I saw Dell acquiring something in deduplication. Those were backup deduplication appliances. Today, less than three years later, deduplication is inside the array. Every single new array will have deduplication compression inside. That's again to that, to that buying cycle of the five years. I don't even know what's going to be in the array as a primary feature in two to three years. Flexible architectures. Look for the vendors that will be able to add in those components, modules. However, the one, you spoke about uh, Coho data this morning that they're adding microservices just for if they want to do an analytics thing, they're spin up a microservice. That is what I mean with a flexible architecture. Coho could pretty much bring in anything in a microservice on their storage area if they want to. And next, and this is where the question comes, well, will hyperconverge be everything I need to have in my infrastructure? No, but it could be and it should be your primary building block. For your 80, 90% of your applications, of your solutions, you should be using a hyperconverged solution because you'll get a lot more time for the best of breed solutions. For that 10, 20% that cannot run on a hyperconverged infrastructure, you'll have more time to work on that, to buy a smaller um, Skyera, violin, never, never mind to do that specific application. I do not believe in a one size fits all. I believe today in a stack for the primary building block and best of breed solutions next to that for specific applications. So here's my summary slide. Hyperconvergence is not a standard. Change your buying cycle. Not, do not buy today what you don't need tomorrow. Minimize infrastructure maintenance, implementation time. Um, and I don't know, be flexible, hyperconverge first, plus best of breed. This is what I think that hyperconverge brings to the market. It is more a business value than a technical value.